peers and board members who are here. Um, thank you to our volunteers who are in the back helping with check-in and the info table. If you haven't had a chance to swing back there, we are giving away two tickets to the um, City of Light bus tour that's coming up on March 23rd. So if you're available that day at 1 p.m. and you'd like a chance to win, make sure you go enter your first and last name. I want to also give a big thank you to the First Church uh, staff who are here tonight, Chuck, who is my tech support, and uh, Rama, who's the building security, so thank you to them. And of course, many thanks to Eleanor. I'm sure you'll hear about some of the difficulties she encountered putting her presentation together, so we made it. <laughs> um, Eleanor will be speaking about the artistic legacy of Josef Swavinsky, who is an artist. I think you'll end up recognizing many of his works and not realizing that it's all by this same person, so I think that'll be really interesting. Um, and I am here tonight to present about trailblazers in Buffalo. So let's jump in and get started. So what is a trailblazer? According to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, a trailblazer is one who blazes a trail to guide others or a pathfinder. So for the purposes of our talk tonight, I'm, uh, talking, I'm taking trailblazer to mean someone who has significantly blazed a trail for Buffalo in particular. Um, and in so doing, making a lasting contribution to both of the city and then to their community at large, whether it's the field of work that they're in. Um, we'll learn a little bit more about that. Of course, um, any list where we're selecting the uh, representative samples of something is going to be biased. So you may very well have chosen a handful of different people to be in this presentation. And of course, there's many people I would have liked to include it, and I simply didn't have the time. Um, so these are some of my most favorites and the people that I think have made the greatest impact. So the first person I want to talk to you about tonight is um, one of the early inhabitants of Buffalo, Margaret St. John. So she was born Margaret Marsh on September 22nd, 1766 in Kent, Connecticut, and she went on to marry Gamaliel St. John of Norwalk, Connecticut. I love that name, Gal Gamaliel. Um, they were married in October 1788, and they did live in Connecticut for a time before eventually moving to Oneida County, and then to a farm in Williamsville, and then eventually in 1810 they made their way to Buffalo. Um, Gamaliel kept a tavern at Main and Court Streets, and the couple had, now I couldn't, sources gave me different numbers, so they had either 11 or 12 children, and I can't pinpoint an exact number, but many children. This is a picture of the house that they had in Buffalo on Main Street. They also had an inn beside the house, which is not shown in this picture here. So when the War of 1812 broke out, Gamaliel and his eldest son, Elijah, became active in the militia. However, on June 6, 1813, both Gamaliel and Elijah drowned in the Niagara River when their boat capsized after coming into contact with the war vessel, the John Adams. They'd been carrying dispatches from the Army headquarters in Buffalo to a division in Canada. The war continued on, and on December 10, 1813, American soldiers led by General George McClure burned the Canadian town of Newark, which is today approximately where uh, Niagara-on-the-Lake is. This enraged the British soldiers that their town had been raided and burned. So they responded by capturing Fort Niagara and then moving down the US uh, along the Niagara River. So coming down from Fort Niagara towards Buffalo. Raiding everything in their path, setting fire to all the towns in their path. So on the night of December 29th, a battle erupted in Black Rock between the British and the American militia. And the Buffalo militia saw little hope um, in their advance against the British, so they fleed the attack to Buffalo to warn their families and the residents there to get out. So in the early morning of December 30th, after hearing this fighting and going on throughout the night and seeing the militia coming back and saying, get out, get out, this is not safe, the British are advancing, um, Buffalonians gathered up their possessions and fled for their lives. The British soldiers, so this is a picture of, of a drawing of the burning of Buffalo, an artistic rendering. 
And then the British soldiers eventually made their way into Buffalo down, Buffalo down Niagara Street with their Native American allies crossing through the forest and entering the village um, from near Topper Street. So by the time these forces arrived, most of the residents in Buffalo at that time had fled. Um, and Buffalo only had a population of about four to 500 at that time. So Margaret St. John, who was now widowed and without her eldest son, had to find a way to keep her younger children safe. She came up with a plan to evacu evacuate her family from Buffalo in two trips with the help of one of her stepsons, Mr. Asaph Bemis, who would accompany the first group and then come back and get Margaret and the remaining children and take them out. Um, however, because of the chaos of the raid, Mr. Bemis was not able to return, so this left Margaret and two of her daughters stranded in their house while the British and the Native Americans were attacking. Um, and this is an artistic drawing actually by one of Margaret St. John's, St. John's sons of Buffalonians fleeing the village. So, um, according to contemporary accounts of the attack, Margaret actually witnessed one of her neighbors, Sarah Lovejoy, being attacked by Native American warriors. Um, Margaret watched as Sarah used a knife to try to fight off a Native American who had broken into her house, um, but she ended up being killed by Tomahawk. So the Native American looted the house and then set it on fire, leaving Sarah Lovejoy's body inside. And before the fire grew out of control, Margaret and her daughters went into the house, took Sarah's body out, and uh, put out the fire. After the fire was put out, they moved Sarah Lovejoy's body back inside, thinking, OK, when all of this is over, she can receive a proper burial with her loved ones. Um, unfortunately, that ended up being optimistic thinking because her house was burned the next day. So in the midst of this raid, and Margaret St. John you know, sees this awful attack on her neighbor across the street from her. She's got her daughters with her. Eventually, um, a British officer comes to her house and, according to different accounts, says, why are you not away? So Margaret explains that she'd missed the evacuation, and now she had no choice but to stay home or die in the cold. Um, she then sought out the commanding British officer, Finnis Rail, and asked him to send a guard to keep the warriors from burning my house and plundering my goods and clothing. So the British were the enemy. You know, Margaret St. John was an American and a Buffalonian. There is no logical or documented reason why Rail would have offered her protection, but he did. So he agreed and he sent a guard to watch her house, and while the St. John house survived, the inn that was beside it was incinerated. Um, the St. John House was the only residential dwelling that ended up surviving the raid, um, and only two other non-residential buildings remained. There was a jail on Washington Street and then David Reese's blacksmith shop on Seneca Street. In total, there were 24 recorded civilian casualties as a result of the burning of Buffalo, and it is quite likely that the number would have been 27 if Margaret hadn't had the courage to stand up for herself and her daughters. After the raid, Margaret and her daughters became integral in the rebuilding of the village. Um, so this, this picture, if you can see, I find this picture fascinating. This is another drawing by one of uh, Margaret's sons. And according to this artistic rendering, this is all that remained of the houses of Buffalo residents after the burning. So you have the foundation, the basement, and then the chimneys. So these would have been made out of stone. Everything else made out of wood would have been incinerated. So Buffalonians coming back to these conditions, um, Margaret and her daughters helped them out. So they became integral in the rebuilding of the village. As Buffalo started to repopulate and rebuild, Margaret and her daughters took in and aided the refugees, many of whom ended up building makeshift roof over their basements um, to survive the cold winter. As for her own livelihood, Margaret and her daughters um, were able to support themselves through their widowhood and through rebuilding um, by selling needlework to the residents. So Margaret died um, on April 29th, 1847, and she's actually buried in Forest Lawn, so you can go and see her headstone. There's also an unmarked brick from the St. John House, which is preserved in the Frank and Jane Clement Brick Museum in Orchard Park, and I believe visiting the museum is by appointment only, as far as I can tell. 
So I believe that without the St. John House and the aid that Margaret and her daughters provided to the refugees, Buffalo either would not have been rebuilt or it would have taken much longer for it to rebuild and become the village that it did. And it is good that it rebuilt and became the village that it did because our next trailblazer um, that we'll talk about comes um, into the picture as a result of this regrowing post-war of 1812 Buffalo. So our next trailblazer is Samuel Wilkinson. He was born um, on June 1st, 1781 in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. And he embodied the hearty, must-do spirit exhibited by the St. John's and that, I believe, thrives in the DNA of what it means to be a Buffalonian today. Wilkeson eventually made his way to Buffalo in 1812 when he was asked by General William Henry Harrison to build a fleet of ships for the U.S. military during the War of 1812. He left his wife and children in Portland, New York, near Westfield, and moved into the, into the village to help with the war effort. Um, his family did eventually join him in Buffalo, and they ended up staying here until 1848, so for quite a period of time. During his time in Buffalo, Wilkeson flourished into an accomplished businessman and community member. After the war, he opened a general store on Niagara Street, um, near Main Street, and then in 1815, he opened a meat market. He went on to be named director of the Bank of Niagara in 1819, and eventually became involved in building Buffalo's first iron foundry. He was later appointed as judge of the Court of Common Pleas in Niagara County and eventually became the first person to hold a judgeship in Erie County. So as a part of his community work in Buffalo, Wilkeson became instrumental in securing Buffalo as the location for the western terminus of the Erie Canal. Um, Buffalo was considered a favorable location because of its proximity to Lake Erie, um, so it could be easily accessible by the lake boats coming in from the Midwest carrying grain. Um, however, one major drawback about Buffalo is that it did not have a natural harbor. Meanwhile, our contender to the north, Black Rock, which was its own village at the time, did have a natural harbor, um, so it was also an attractive ending point for the canal. However, Black Rock was further up the Niagara River from Lake Erie, so both had pros and cons. Um, but Wilkeson was, he realized that having the western terminus of the Erie Canal would be an incredible boost to our economy and our workforce. So he spearheaded the five-year project to develop Buffalo's Harbor and convinced the state to extend the canal to Buffalo. As a part of his efforts, Wilkeson had to tackle the challenge of securing funding for the dredging of the harbor. Um, they eventually, Buffalonians decided to appeal to the state for funding, and the state agreed to provide a loan of $12,000, which would be about $200,000 um, today, on the condition that the full amount of the loan be secured by bonds and mortgages of individuals. Um, of course, many Buffalo residents at the time did not have the kind of money to make an investment like that and were very uncertain about entering into that kind of a, a contract. So Wilkeson, along with colleagues Charles Townsend and Oliver Forward, stepped forward and offered to fund the full amount. So it was riding on them. With that funding issue settled, now it was time to find an engineer who could lead the dredging project. Oh, so that's a picture of the Buffalo Harbor. I was wondering why that didn't show up for you. So that's Buffalo Creek um, down here near the end of uh, like where we think of Canal Side today. And so this uh, was blocked by a, like a sandbar that needed to be dredged out so that boats could enter. There we go. So now we needed to find an engineer to actually dredge the harbor now that we had the funding. So um, Wilkeson and a team um, did hire an experienced harbor builder, but they soon realized he wouldn't be able to complete the project on that scale on that limited budget of $12,000. And even though Wilkeson had no knowledge of harbor building, he decided to step up and take on the project himself. He oversaw every aspect of the project, from the clerical work and supervision of the laborers to checking, measuring, and inventorying all the supplies. Wilkeson admitted, I had never seen a harbor and was engaged in business that required my unremitting attention. So I just think today, like, I built some bookshelves in my house from scratch, and like I had YouTube videos that I could watch to like know how to build these bookshelves. Wilkeson had never like 
seen a harbor, never done this before, and was just like, yep, I'm gonna do it. So <laughs> to me, that's pretty impressive. Um, the project took five years, um, and just a little fun fact for you, after um, Wilkinson's first wife passed away, he ended up marrying Sarah St. John, who was one of the daughters of Margaret St. John. Um, so along with being one of the people who was instrumental in helping rebuild Buffalo after it was burned, she was also one of the first people to dig what would eventually become a part of the Erie Canal. So that's pretty, um, in Buffalo at least, so that's pretty cool. Wilkeson continued his dedicated community work throughout his life. He went on to serve as a senator from 1826 to 1829. And after Buffalo was incorporated as a city, anybody know when? 1832, he became mayor. Um, in 1836, he was elected mayor and served a one-year term. Um, during that time, his house actually stood on Niagara Square, where City Hall is located today. So I think it's kind of fitting that this man who was so instrumental in the, in the founding of our city really um, lived in the space where City Hall is today. Wilkeson eventually left Buffalo and died in Teleco Plains, Tennessee on June 1st, 1848 and his house was torn down in 1915. But when we think of Canal Side and Buffalo's waterfront today and the recreational and tourist opportunities it affords our city, I believe that we have to pay homage to Wilkeson and his fellow Buffalonians who saw the potential for Buffalo to become a major port city and were willing to put their own money, time, and energy on the line um, to bring that potential to life. So this is a picture of Wilkeson Point, of course, which is one of my favorite places in Buffalo. And the work that Wilkeson engaged in helped pave the way for our next trailblazer, Joseph Dart. So Joseph Dart was born in East Hampton, Connecticut in 1799, and very likely he was drawn to Buffalo at that time because of its swiftly growing reputation as an economic hub. So he arrived in Buffalo in 1821, and just if, that was just a few years before the Erie Canal would be finished, and of course, um, we would start to really pick up speed in our growth. He went into the hat and fur business with a man named Joseph Stocking, and they co-owned a hat and fur store at the corner of Main and Swan Streets. Over time, Dart learned to speak Iroquois and became adept at trading furs with local Native Americans. He married Dortha Dennison of Norfolk, Connecticut in 1830, and the couple lived in various locations around downtown Buffalo. They moved around quite a bit. Once the Erie Canal opened and the grain industry began to pick up in Buffalo, Dart decided to leave the hat and fur business and go into the much more lucrative grain industry. Um, in a speech given to the Buffalo and Erie County Historical Society in 1865, Dart explained the reasoning behind his switch, saying, it seemed to me, as I reflected on the amazing extent of the grain-producing regions of the Prairie West and the favorable position of Buffalo for receiving their products, that the eastward movements of grain through this port would soon ex exceed anything the boldest imagination had conceived. And he was not wrong. In 1829, Buffalo handled approximately 8,000 bushels of grain, flour, and wheat. Only a year later, Buffalo was handling about 180,000 bushels. By 1842, Buffalo handled 3 million, and by 1861, we were handling well over 60 million bushels um, annually. For years, um, the flour, wheat, and grains coming in were all transported in and out of lake boats, canal barges, and storage canals using manual labor, often provided by low-paid, overworked Irish immigrants. Using human labor in this way, no more than 2,000 bushels a day could be moved out of a ship's hold. So um, Dart knew about this, and he also knew about an invention that he had seen, which was simply a conveyor belt that the American miller Oliver Evans had invented for use in grain milling. And so Dart began to wonder about the possibility of applying the same conveyor belt principle to a method of unloading grain cargo from ship holds. He consulted a man named Robert Dunbar, who was a mechanical engineer and could provide um, advice on the technical and engineering aspects of the design, and together they developed the grain elevator. 
This was essentially a vertical conveyor belt with buckets attached to it that could be lowered into the hold of a ship to scoop grain up and out, dumping it into the top of a silo before heading back down into the ship's hold. And many of you may already know about these if you've attended our talks before or taken any of our silo city or canal side tours. Um, they built their first grain elevator at the junction of Buffalo Creek and the Evans Ship Hold, which is near where the present um, Vietnam Veterans Memorial is today. And I don't know if the marker is currently there. I know that it has been there, and I know that it has also been stolen somehow. These things are really heavy, so I don't know how people seal them and move them. So at this present moment, I don't know if you walked out there if you would see it, but it's supposed to be there, marking the location of the very first grain elevator. So when they were building this grain elevator, Dart's contemporaries ridiculed him, thinking that the idea was outlandish, and all of his contemporaries were firmly rooted in this belief that there was no better labor than a man's back. So does anybody remember what I said the maximum amount of bushels you could unload in a day using human labor was? 2,000. Dart's elevator could unload 2,000 bushels in an hour. So the first ship unloaded by Dart's elevator was a schooner, schooner, um, called schooner. Thank you. Called the St. John Skinner, uh, or the John S. Skinner, excuse me, from Ohio. She docked at Dart's elevator in the early afternoon, and was on her way back to Ohio only several hours later. She made a return trip to Milan, Ohio, and transferred her second cargo back to Buffalo before the other ships that had arrived at the same time as her even left Buffalo in the first place. So, of course, his contemporaries quickly changed their mind about this being an outlandish idea, and within 15 years Dart's elevator was built, after Dart's elevator was built, there were 10 additional grain elevators in operation along Buffalo's harbor, seven of which were built in the first two years after Dart's elevator. This led to Buffalo quickly becoming the largest grain port in the world, and these first elevators were constructed in wood. The problem with wood is that grain is highly flammable. <laughs> also, wood is um, not as resistant to insects, rodents, and uh, humidity water. So eventually, engineers, um, several years after Dart's death, he passed away in 1879, engineers landed on concrete as the best construction material for the silos. Um, and the method of construction that was used to build the silos, which is called continuous pore slip form, uh, was developed to help build these large monstrous structures in a short amount of time. So the American elevator here, um, the first part that you see, was built in only 10 days time. Yes, so steel reinforced rebar to help with the height and then the concrete was poured around the steel rebar. Oh, the silos themselves are steel. Interesting. I would think that that wouldn't have caught on as well um, as concrete because steel does have a tendency to rust. It weathers, I think, more easily than concrete. But they did test many different building materials. They tried brick, I think they tried terracotta, all different things, and eventually concrete was selected as like the most durable. Um, these concrete elevators, with their austere, decorationless exterior and their strict adherence to form following function, had a massive influence on modernist architecture. Architects came from all over the world to study them. The famed French architect Charles Édouard de Genere, better known as Le Corbusier, said of the elevators, Thus, we have the American grain elevators and factories, the magnificent first fruits of a new age. The American engineers overwhelm with their calculations our expiring architecture. Walter Gropius, a German avant-garde architect and one of the founders of the Bauhaus School of Architecture, collected photos of the American elevators and published the images in various formats so as to circulate them throughout Europe. Um, and modernist uh, artists and architects thus began to be really influenced by that, um, just as you can see, very austere, um, no exterior decoration, no exterior colors, um, and just that insane adherence to the form of the building being derived from the function that the building is used for. 
Um, German Jewish architect Eric Mendelssohn visited Buffalo specifically to see these structures up close. And he wrote to his wife, um, I, I just love this uh, quote, so I'll read it to you. He wrote to his wife, mountainous silos, incredibly space conscious, but creating a space, a random confusion amidst the chaos of loading and unloading corn ships, of railways and bridges, crane monsters with live gestures, hordes of silo cells in concrete, stone, and glazed brick. Then, suddenly, a silo with administrative buildings, closed horizontal fronts against the stupendous verticals of 50 to 100 cylinders, and all this in the sharp evening light. I took photographs like mad. Everything else so far seemed to have been shaped interim to my silo dreams. So for me, Silo City still has that magic, even when I go there today, that Mendelssohn described so poetically in that letter. Dart's invention not only revolutionized the face of the grain industry worldwide, as well as influencing the development of modern architecture internationally, also his elevators have taken a firm stance as one of the central images of Buffalo in our history. Who doesn't think of our waterfront without thinking of the ghostly silos that dot the shoreline? And what tourist today doesn't want to visit Silo City or do that zip lining at Riverworks that they have now? The grain elevators have become a defining feature of Buffalo, so of course Joseph Dart had to be one of our trailblazers. Dart remained an active member of the Buffalo community throughout his life. Um, he was one of the founders of Buffalo Seminary School, um, the all-girls college preparatory school, and he was a member of the Historical Society. He passed away on September 28, 1879. And I didn't include a picture of it, but he is buried at Forest Lawn, so you can see his um, headstone there. The next trailblazer that we're going to speak about, and I believe if you were at our last session, you may have heard a little bit about him, is William Wells Brown. So in the early half of the 19th century, Buffalo was establishing itself as a growing economic center. It was a developing northern city, close to various waterways, as well as to the border of Canada. So, because of all these things, we um, became an attractive refuge for free blacks, fugitive slaves, and also vibrant abolitionist activities. Um, William Wells Brown was born around 1814 in Montgomery County, Kentucky, and he was born into slavery. His mother, Elizabeth, was held as a slave by Dr. John Young. She had seven children, all by different fathers. And William's father was a white man um, named George W. Higgins, a planter and also a descendant of Stephen Hopkins, who was one of the um, original pilgrims on the Mayflower. Williams was told several times, or sold several times to various slaveholders, and he made one failed escape attempt with his mother before eventually escaping for good in 1834 at the age of 20. He escaped to Ohio and took the name of Wells Brown, which was the name uh, of a Quaker who had aided him in establishing himself uh, with money, food, shelter, clothing um, after his escape. He married Elizabeth Schooner during their first years of freedom, and together they eventually settled in Boston, where Brown worked for abolitionist causes. Brown was heavily involved in various sorts of social reform during his lifetime. Um, he supported not only abolition, but also temperance, women's suffrage, pacifism, prison reform, and the anti-tobacco movement. Along with all of his activist work, um, Brown became a prolific writer. So his 1852 memoir, um, he had written, he who escapes from slavery at the age of 20 years without any education, as did the writer of this letter, must read when others are asleep if he would catch up with the rest of the world. Um, I certainly think he caught up. His novel, Clotel, is considered the uh, first novi novel published by an African American. Um, not the first novel published by an African American in the US, because it, this was actually published in London while he was there lecturing, but the first by an African American to be published, so a very slight distinction. Um, the novel is about Clotel and her sister, who were fictional slave daughters of Thomas Jefferson, who we know kept slaves and was married, married to a slave. Um, and it explores the destructive effects of slavery on African-American families. 
This novel was the first instance of an African-American writer dramatizing the underlying hypocrisy of democratic principles in the face of slavery. Um, Brown is also recognized by many scholars to be the first published African-American playwright. And his 1847 memoir, pictured here, the title page, um, the narrative of William W. Brown, a fugitive slave, written by himself, became a bestseller second only to Frederick, Frederick Douglass's memoir, um, the narrative of Frederick Douglass. So he was very well known by his contemporaries in his time. Um, because of his celebrated literary accomplishments, he was actually one of the first writers to be inducted into the Kentucky Writers Hall of Fame when it was established in 2013. We're about to get there. So Brown moved from Boston to Buffalo and lived here from 1836 to 1845. Um, there's a historic marker on Pine Street at the location where his house once stood. Today it's in front of the First Shiloh Baptist Church, which is about two blocks north of Chef's Restaurant. And during his time here, Brown um, actually worked as a steamboat operator on Lake Erie, which provided him a perfect opportunity to help fugitive slaves. Um, he'd hide them on his boat and transport them either to Buffalo, if he was coming here, um, to Detroit, or, of course, to Canada. Um, Brown claims to have transported 69 fugitive slaves to Canada by this method over a seventh-month period in 1842. I had to include this tidbit because I thought this was amazing. A man named Josiah Henderson escaped from slavery by crossing um, from Black Rock into Canada in 1830. And I mentioned Josiah Henderson because he actually became the inspiration um, for Uncle Tom and Uncle Tom's cabin. So I can't help but wonder if Brown might have been the boat driver that transported him across the river. Um, along with his direct involvement in transporting fugitive slaves um, along the Underground Railroad, Brown became an active abolitionist in Buffalo, mostly centered around the Michigan Street Baptist Church, which still stands today. Um, at the church and various other venues, Brown gave public speeches in support of abolition, and he often used music to complement his messages and help portray his feeling. He eventually moved from Buffalo, and in 1849, he traveled to Europe as a representative of the U.S. International Peace Congress in Paris. He was lecturing in England um, and throughout Europe when the Fugitive Slave Law of 1850 passed in the US. Um, so because he was an escaped slave and a very recognizable public figure, he was incredibly anxious about uh, the idea that he would get recaptured and re-enslaved if he were returned to the US. So he remained um, in Europe for several years. Um, eventually, a British couple who um, a British couple purchased his freedom, and they were also the same couple who purchased the freedom of Frederick, Doug Frederick Douglass. So in 1854, he returned to the US, um, and eventually he passed away on November 6th, 1840, 1884, excuse me. So as of 2013, there are 31 specific and known references of Underground Railroad incidences in Buffalo including two public meetings to oppose the Fugitive Slave Act. Of these references, only three mention specific places um, en route to Canada where fugitives would have been given refuge. So although the Michigan Street Baptist Church is thought to have been um, a place of harbor for these fugitive slaves, there is not actually any existing documentation in support of that theory. Um, but of course, that makes a lot of sense because the Underground Railroad was, you know, a life or death, a chance that many people were taking, both for riders and operators, um, and so it would have been essential to maintain the utmost secrecy and avoid any revealing documentation, um, which would have led to its discovery. I include this picture, which of course is metaphoric, we all know was not actually a railroad, um, but this reminds me of a book by Colson Whitehead that was just published, I wanna say in the last two years, called The Underground Railroad. It's a fictional account, but it's a really harrowing account of what um, escaped slaves might have to go through and deal with on this journey along the Underground Railroad, and in his novel, it's an actual railroad, so there's a little bit of magical realism. So I wanted to be able to give you that book recommendation, which is why I used that picture. Our next um, trailblazer is Mary Burnett Talbert. She was also affiliated with that Michigan Street Baptist Church, and 
Honestly, in doing research about Mary Talbert, I have no idea like where she got the energy to do all the things that she did or like when she slept. Like she is just amazing the things that she accomplished. Um, she was described by her peers as the best known colored woman in the United States. Um, she was born on September 17, 1866 in Oberlin, Ohio. At a time when few women and even fewer African American women attended college, Burnett studied art at Oberlin College in Ohio, graduating in 1886. She was the only African-American woman in her graduating class. After graduating, she became a teacher at Bethel University in Little Rock, Arkansas, and in 1887, she was hired as assistant principal of Union High School in Little Rock. Um, at that time, assistant principal was the highest position held by an African-American woman in the entire state. She married William Talbert in 1891, and the couple moved to Buffalo and joined the Michigan Street Baptist Church. Talbert eventually um, became the church's treasurer. So Talbert was an active uh, suffragist and women's rights advocate, and an early proponent for intersectional feminism, which um, boiled down to its core, reminds white women of their obligations um, to less privileged women of color. She advocated for women of all races working together to advance their common cause. She was invited to speak at the Votes for Women Symposium by leading, think leading thinkers of colored women, which was held in Washington, D.C. in 1915. And she helped to organize various women's clubs to develop black female leaders and black female-led organizations. Because of her work, she was eventually elected to serve as president of the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs and she served in that capacity from 1916 to 1921. She represented the association at the very first African American, as the very first African American delegate to the International Cong Congress of Women at their fifth Congress in Norway in 1920. Her committed work to women's rights led her to being appointed to the Women's Committee on International Relations, which selected female nominees for positions in the League of Nations. So she worked her way up and became an internationally important uh, figure in women's rights. Along with her support of women's rights, Talbert was also an early player in the national civil rights movement. Um, she protested the exclusion of black people from the 1901 Pan American Exposition Planning Commission. And as a result of that protesting, um, the committee decided to include an African American exhibit, which featured the cultural and economic achievements of black Americans. In 1901, when the exposition took place, she founded the Christian Culture Congress, which was a literary society and forum, and it invited a number of prominent African-American speakers of the day to Buffalo to speak at the Michigan Street Baptist Church. Um, one of their most prominent guests was W.E.B. Dubois. Talbert was, of course, also a founder of the Niagara Movement which is recognized by many as the beginning of 20th century American civil rights activism and is the precursor to the NAACP. She co-founded Buffalo's first chapter of the NAACP in 1910 and was elected to the chapter's board um, later on. She moved her way up the organization nationally, which it seems like she had such a penchant for doing, just getting these amazing leadership positions wherever she was involved. Um, and she went on to serve as vice president of the NAACP. She was also selected as the national director for the NAACP's anti-lynching campaign of 1921. Along with her involvement in women's rights and civil rights movements, Talbert was also a well-known preservationist. She was instrumental in saving the Frederick Douglass home in Anacostia, DC, after other efforts to do so had failed. As a result of her efforts preserving the home, she was elected president for life of the Frederick Douglass Memorial and Historical Association. Um, though Talbert passed away on October 15, 1923, her legacy continues on strong today. Um, multiple NAACP branches across the US are named after her. Talbert Hall at UB is named after her. And she was inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame in Seneca Falls in 2005. Her influence, her influence stretches well beyond Buffalo, and I believe every Buffalonian should know her name, um, and that as a city, 
There must be continued efforts to celebrate Mary Talbert and her incredible lifetime of work advancing the rights of women, people of color, and black women in particular. So that's my little plug for Mary Talbert. Finally, the last trailblazer that we are going to talk about is Louise Blanchard Bethune, who's one of my favorite Buffalonians. Um, similar to Mary Talbert, Bethune was an advocate for women's rights and equality. Um, in her speech, Women in Architecture, which was delivered at the Women's Educational and Industrial Union in 1891, Bethune stated that the future of women in the architectural profession is what she herself sees fit to make it. I think Bethune certainly had a clear image of how she saw fit to carve a space for herself in architecture and change the face of professional architecture in the United States as a result. Um, she was born Jenny Louise Blanchard in Waterloo, New York in 1856. Her parents were teachers and her twin younger siblings died early on in her life, so she essentially grew up as an only child. She was educated at home, and with her parents' background as teachers and also undivided attention as an only child, um, it's generally believed that she received a much better education than she would have received at a girls' school at that time. Also because of Waterloo's proximity to Seneca Falls, Blanchard grew up in the orbit of the women's rights movement. Um, this first women's rights convention had been held shortly before Blanchard's birth in 1848, and the progressive environment was likely a strong influence on Blanchard, um, shaping her disregard for any conventional limitations on what women should or shouldn't do. The Blanchard family moved to Buffalo in 1866 when Louise was 10 years old, and the family lived at 325 Porter Avenue, which is just down the street from here where Duville campus is today. Blanchard attended Buffalo High School, which is now known as Hutch Tech, and she expressed an adeptness in mathematics and architectural drawing. She graduated in 1874, and though she dreamed of attending the School of Architecture that had recently opened at Cornell, she eventually decided to take a more traditional route into the field and ended up um, becoming an apprentice at the architectural firm of Waite and Calkins in Buffalo. She worked for their firm for five years as a student apprentice, and eventually worked her way up as an assistant to wait. Um, she worked long hours, often worked six days a week, reading, studying, drafting, um, working really diligently. Um, while she was there working, she met her future husband, Robert Armour Bethune, and with his help, she opened her own architectural office at 531 Main Street, near where Gold Dome Bank is today. Um, she opened it in October 1881, and while there's no documentation of her saying so, um, no documentation proving so, it's widely speculated that Blanchard timed the opening of her office to coincide with the Ninth Congress of the Association for the Advancement of Women, which convened in Buffalo in October of 1881, so exact same month. The Congress provided a platform for women to speak about their social, cultural, economic, and professional positions. It was attended by 975 women and 25 men. So they showed up. Robert and Louise were married in December 1881. They had one child, Charles, in 1883. After their marriage, of course, the firm became R.A. and L. Bethune. And although Robert became a co-partner in the firm, Louise continued to own it herself, at least up until 1886, according to her own will and other documents. Um, during this time, Bethune was elected the first female member of the American Institute of Architects in 1888, and thereby she earned her title as the first professionally recognized female architect in the United States. She was also one of the major organizers behind the founding of the Architects, Associ Architects Association in Buffalo in 1886, which would go on to become the Buffalo chapter of the American Institute of Architects, where Bethune held uh, office as vice president and also treasurer. In 1890, William R. Fuchs joined the firm, and the name changed to Bethune, Bethune, and Fuchs. The firm you see was, or the firm, as you see here in this picture, represented, um, along with a an, uh, draftsman, an apprentice draftsman, who would have joined at the time as well. Um, the firm was largely successful and quickly grew into one of the busiest firms in Buffalo. They produced a continuous stream of industrial, commercial, and educational buildings for various clients. Bethune herself 
hated residential architecture. She hated designing homes. She thought it was one of the worst forms of architectural work you could do. And instead, her specialty was school buildings. Um, she's known to have designed, had to have been the primary designer of 18 unique school buildings in Western New York. Because of her work and her reputation, many people expected that Bethune would enter the women's architectural design competition for the women's building at the Chicago World's Fair in 1893. However, Bethune refused to participate on the basis that while male architects were appointed to design major buildings and were paid $10,000 for artistic services rendered with all construction um, costs made at the expense of the fair, women architects were asked to compete um, for a prize of only $1,000, and that did not include construction materials or documents. The women were expected to provide that. Bethune was a staunch believer in equal remuneration for equal service, or as we say today, equal pay for equal work, and she was appalled at this inequity that the fair showed her in how it treated male and female architects. While her refusal to participate didn't change anything in the structure of that fair, it certainly um, provided an enduring example of a woman standing up for that principle, that belief of equal pay for equal work. Um, of course, one of the buildings Bethune is most well known for, and I'm sure all of you have seen this building, is the Hotel Lafayette. Um, this building was meant to be ready in time to house visitors to the Pan American Exposition in 1901, but it was delayed because of, what do you think? Strikes. Not strikes, money. Many things get delayed because of money. So delayed because of money funding issues. Eventually, of course, the hotel did get built, not until 1904 after the expo had ended. Um, according to City Hall building permit lodgers, the estimated total cost for the Hotel Lafayette in that time um, was $425,000, which today would be about 12 million. Um, it's a French Renaissance-style hotel, and when it opened, it was considered the best that science, art, and experience can offer for the comfort of the traveling public, as well as one of the most perfectly appointed and magnificent hotels in the country. There was hot and cold running water in every bathroom. There was one bathroom between every two rooms, rather than a bathroom for an entire corridor or even an entire floor. Um, and there were telephones in every room, so this was like luxury in that day. Um, today the hotel is listed on the National Register of Historic Places and it's one of the major players in Buffalo's Renaissance today. Um, it's owned by Rocco Termini. He has turned the building around, developed it into apartments. Um, there are still hotel rooms, of course event space. There are vendors in there. Um, it's a really cool building so I'm thankful that it's a part of our Buffalo Renaissance. Bethune was an advocate for women's equality throughout her life, evidenced in both her unflagging work at a time when the field of architecture was hardly considered a space for women. Um, in her famous speech, Women in Architecture, delivered in 1891, she traced this connection between women and architecture. So she really believed that women did have a place in architecture. So she traced this connection between women and architecture back to the obelisk of Queen Hatshepsut in Egypt um, and the enduring testament it provided to the queen's contributions to the Temple of Amun-Ra. So she went back to antiquity and she said, women have been here all along, we deserve to be here, I'm here. You know, she just, she really believed in that. However, I think it's important to note that Bethune didn't necessarily view her ideas as radical. So even though she was taking this really firm stance for the professionalism of women, um, she simply believed that women should adapt themselves to be proficient in every every aspect of their field, so as to be judged on their merits as professionals rather than on their accomplishments as women. There's a huge distinction there. It was almost as if she were gender blind and that she placed more care on professionalism regardless of gender. Bethune passed away on December 18th, 1952, 1915 in Buffalo um, and is buried at Forest Lawn as well. So that's a picture of her headstone. Um, so, to wrap this all up, there are, of course, many more people that I could have included in this talk, many more incredible Buffalonians who um, simply I didn't have space for. But I'd like to end our talk tonight by returning to the beginning, to the story of Margaret St. John. 
So in a December 30th, 2013 article on the burning of Buffalo, Angela Keppel, the author, urges us to remember the St. John family and all of the settlers of Buffalo. Remember the spirit of the earliest settlers of Buffalo who were not afraid to brave a winter in makeshift homes in order to build what became our city. I believe that pioneer spirit still lives in Buffalo today. I too believe this pioneer trailblazing spirit lingers on in each of us and that we have a deep love for our city and an unfazed belief that Buffalo will continue to grow and thrive. I see it in the way neighborhoods along Grant, Broadway, Hurdle, Allen, and other streets are alive with locally owned restaurants, shops, art galleries, and more. And I hope you all see it too and carry this trailblazing outlook with you as you go through life and blaze your own paths for the people behind you. Thank you so much. Okay, I got started a little late, but we're going a little over. Any questions before we take a short intermission? Yes. Um, was Wilkinson a lawyer or, or just a businessman who became a judge? Is that what I understood? Yes. So he was a businessman, um, and just because of his prominence in the business community, he went on to become a judge. I don't believe he ever was an official lawyer at any time. I'm going to bring the mic over just because our tech guy will yell at me if we don't record the questions that you all have. How did you get interested in this? Thank you, Mary Alice. Um, I, that's a good question. I feel um, often it's very easy to tell often it's very easy to tell the same story over and over. And so I wanted to try to include some people whose stories maybe we don't have a chance to hear quite as often. Um, and hopefully you all have learned something new that you didn't know before you heard this talk tonight. That's why I wanted to do this, to help spread the word of these people who I find really fascinating and really interesting, and who, in my opinion, don't get enough credit in the city for everything that they did, both here and outside of Buffalo. Is there another question? Outside of the Lafayette Hotel, are there any other Bethune buildings that are still standing in Buffalo? <laughs> That's a great question. Yes, there are. I do not know the list of all of the buildings that are standing. Um, you can. Um, Chuck LaCusa has a wonderful website, Buffalo Architecture and History. Some of the buildings that are still extant are listed on the website. Um, and also, inside of the Hotel Lafayette itself, there's a museum, sort of museum-style exhibition about Bethune and her life and her work. Um, if you enter the hotel through the main lobby and you pass the registration desk and go up the stairway that's going to be on the left, um, all along the stairway, they have uh, information about uh, Louise Bethune. So yes, there are. I don't know exactly which ones. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you all so much for your attention and your lovely questions. We'll be back in a few minutes. Joseph Swavinsky, please give a warm welcome to Eleanor. Thank you for coming tonight, and thank you for staying for the second talk. Um, Paige had said I had some problems concerning my presentation, and uh, I am not technologically knowledgeable. And this morning, when I went to review my my presentation that I felt so good about in arranging pictures and putting on the text and so forth, um, I opened it up and there were big red X's through most of the pictures. And I'm saying, I gave acknowledgement to a lot of the, uh, to the things that I needed to or whatever, so I didn't know why the, those big red X's were there. I still don't know, right, but fortunately I had copied 
okay, I, a scrap copy, meaning that these, I had s saved some of the pictures and so forth. And so what, what I did is that I, today, almost all of the day, I was salvaging those things and put it together. So we'll see, we'll see what happens. First of all, some of you may already know about Yusuf Slavinsky. Some of you may know a little about him. You may know a lot about him. And so I say thank you for coming, and I hope that uh, this run-through will give us a deeper appreciation or understanding of the man. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar with Yusuf Slavinsky, uh, uh, as I hadn't been for a long time. Hopefully, this will be at least an introduction for you. So, so thank you again for coming. That is Yusuf uh, on the screen to the left with him uh, in his formal suit over at Greycliff. Uh, and then also uh, down on the bottom, he's doing some work um, at Greycliff. Paige, do I point, where do I point this? So I point it at the screen? Yes, I point this at the screen, okay. All right, uh, but the, to move it, to put it over here, okay. All right, now, if you're somewhat like me, I can go for a tour to City Hall. Okay, well, now how do I get this? Ah, I see, I can go a, a tour to City Hall and, and miss an item or perhaps see it and not really pay attention to it. Or I can go to a medical center, this is ECMC, and maybe go to visit a friend or uh, to, to have some tests or whatever and not really pay attention to what is around. Uh, or I can be passing by almost on a daily basis something like this school on the corner or pretty close to the corner of of a military and hurdle and, and not really notice it at all. What I'm doing is I'm showing you places where Yusuf Slavinsky's work um, it, it exists. Right? Um, or I could go to a, a cathedral, uh, to a church over here. This is St. Joseph's Cathedral. And uh, in the baptistry, I, I can see a work by by, um, by Slavinsky, right? Or, or down here, this is Assumption, uh, Our Lady of the Assumption, the Church of the Assumption uh, in Black Rock, um, and uh, quite a bit that he did over there. Or uh, to go on retreat to Stella Niagara in Lewiston, New York, in the upper right-hand corner. Uh, and uh, he, has, he has his work both uh, inside and outside. Uh, they have a beautiful, uh, the sisters had, uh, a beautiful uh, front frontage that, uh, that is near the water, uh, which is now part of the landmark uh, conservancy, land conservancy. But it's, you st it's still accessible. Uh, uh, or uh, uh, if you've ever gone to some of our other educational institutions rather than Hurdle Middle School or uh, Hurdle West, West Hurdle Academy. Uh, Damon College has his work. Villa Maria College has his work. And Buff State has his work. So I'm going to try to go quickly through these. If I'm going too quickly, please let me know to slow down. But we did start 10 minutes later, so I'm hoping that we will finish with enough time uh, for you to have the rest of the evening for yourself. So I needed to do this now. I am not an expert on Yusuf Slavinsky, but I have a great interest in him. And in the process of my learning about him, because I saw this item in City Hall or this, this thing over at uh, ECMC, and I'm saying, who did that? Who did that? Who was that? And I find out that it's a Polish man who came to Buffalo, right? And I'm from Polish ancestry. So that excited me even more. Wow, who is this? Uh, uh, so I acknowledged Chuck Lacusa, and I told him I only put people who were deceased their pictures on there, okay? So it's a good thing that his name is, only his name is over there. Or, and and uh, if you go to his site, okay, both for the history and for the uh, architecture, the Buffalo, uh, Buffalo AH, okay, uh, architectureandhistory.com, uh, I, I used 
many pictures from his particular site. I also uh, uh, am thankful to Dr. Peter Gessner. He died uh, about five years ago, and I, when I was uh, a Buffalo Tours docent, and uh, 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 Peter had asked for Buffalo Tours to help him have a bus tour for Slavinsky. And um, I was the person, uh, Chuck Lacusa was on that tour as well. Uh, and Peter led the tour, uh, but I was the person that tried to make arrangements so that we would get there at a certain time and leave at a certain time and have a certain meal and make sure that there were restrooms. Or, you know, you know the type of there, whatever. So I got to learn. A lot of, I got to contact a lot of people. Um, and uh, Peter was a, a, a president of the Polish Arts Club. And the Polish Arts Club, Peter has put online, and the Polish Arts Club was very supportive of some of the work uh, that you're going to see and you're going to marvel at, I think. Um, Mary Lou Wodobek is a, a friend uh, in, uh, throughout the di di uh, Catholic diocese, uh, and I called her and she was very helpful. Uh, Anne Garner, I don't think I've ever met Anne Garner, but she wrote a wonderful essay. Uh, well, she gave a presentation in 1994 to the Polish Arts Club. And from her presentation, I think it was Peter Gessner who gathered the material and made it into an essay. I, I'm not sure of that background. You see, my research is ongoing, so some of the things that I may learn in the future, I'll say, ah, I need then now to, to correct some of the things I'm saying. And interestingly, okay, um, Bruce Fisher. I discovered Bruce Fisher uh, not at the uh, Frank Lloyd Wright Boathouse, but I think I did meet him there. I think he's a rower, right? And I think I did meet him under different circumstances. Okay, but uh, he wrote two books, uh, at least uh, he probably wrote more, but uh, I went to the Buffalo History Museum and, and Cynthia Van Ness in the History Museum had given me, uh, she said, you know, I, I, had an, I saw an article online by Bruce um, and she said, so there's two books and wouldn't you know it, the 2006 book and the one six years later in, in 2012, uh, what, they, what he did is he put the same chapter about, okay, Greycliffe, Slowinski, and Frank Lloyd Wright, okay? So in case you're looking for it, it's an excellent article by Bruce Fisher that I did that. Uh, now, I'm, what I'm doing is I'm giving you information now so that later on, I, I, I'm not gonna necessarily refer to it, but uh, the archivist over at the Sisters of St. Francis Provincial Office is Sister Mary Serbaki, uh, and she ha was most helpful to me when in 2011, okay, when I need her help, and then all of a sudden, eight years later, here's a familiar, very vaguely familiar name, and so we hit it off right away, right? Um, the other librarians, I talked about Cynthia Van Ness, uh, Melissa Peterson, I have a wonderful story to tell about my experience over at Damon College, Lucy Waite, Wanda uh, Swawinski is uh, uh, Yusuf's widow. And she still does work over at Buff State, right? So I was able to meet and speak with Wanda, and uh, we, we hope to have an ongoing uh, friendship or relationship. And th the innumerable, okay, but secretaries and office staff, if you know the office staff, you know the best person in that area, okay? They know all the stuff. So um, uh, uh, Rosemary over at Assumption uh, Roman Catholic Church, and the lady said it, and I just didn't get her name, at St. Stanislaus Cemetery, but at least she went and found out the answer for me and told me where that artwork is in the cemetery. All right, so now to go on. A little bit about, about Yusuf. Right? He was born in Poland. Uh, in 1905, he started early as an artist. He loved to draw anything and everything. And when he was a youth, he was working in a factory. He tells the story. He was working in a factory, and uh, but any time he had a chance, he would he would take chalks. He, he would take a piece of chalk, and he would draw. He would draw on the walls, on the floor, wherever he was able to uh, able to draw. And uh, he said he thinks that his boss bosses got uh, tired of of getting chalk when they leaned against a building or against a wall or whatever. 
so they fired him. Okay? Uh, they fired him. Actually, what then, okay, it's true, he did fire, but his parents realized he had a great talent. So besides going to day school during the day, they sent him to, night, uh, to school at night, and, and he um, uh, earned scholarships. Uh, he did apprentices, uh, and he really had a, a, a really sophisticated education later on. He, had, he, he was, for 10 years, he was... Um, uh, uh, doing work, okay, that, in, in learning design and in artwork, not only the chemistry, okay, uh, the painting of it, and to to repair churches that had been destroyed in the war, um, uh, and so that that devastation and that destruction of uh, of buildings, he was responsible for for restoring uh, over 150 projects. I mean, the, the mosaics, the walls, the, the pews, the work, everything. If, you, if it needed to be done, he had the, uh, the knowledge and the ability to do it. So he mastered many techniques. He was proficient in many media, but his favorite medium was scraffito. Right? How many of you have heard of scraffito before? We have a few people. Okay, all right. So, uh, what brought him to now America? Uh, when in 1963, uh, he was invited by Monsignor Bogatsky, the pastor of Assumption uh, Church. Uh, to, he was commissioned to do work over there. Now, the parish itself had been established in the late 19th century. Uh, the cornerstone for that building, that's Assumption Church in Black Rock, uh, was laid in 1914. But when, by the time the 60s came along, they needed to do some updating. They needed to do some restoration. They needed to do something different inside. And so that was the reason, I think, that Bogotsky, besides the fact that Swinski was, was uh, 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 Polish, uh, uh, invited him uh, to do that, right? Uh, now, it's, if you have... have have any of you ever been to Assumption on the inside? Okay, so you know, but it's a, it's a huge space. Okay, so that space uh, in, uh, well, in the sanctuary, okay, that space in the sanctuary uh, is quite large. That's a, look at the size of that ceiling. This is, by the way, from Chuck Lacusa's website. Right? Um, uh, uh, if, you, if you look uh, at the scraffiti on the, on the walls, uh, there are five scraffito, scraffiti, I guess would be the plural, um, of Mary, uh, and it starts with the Assumption, because it's the Church of the Assumption, and then there are liturgical symbols that are above. I'm not going to go through all of them, but I just want you to know that they do exist, and even if you're not Catholic, you can probably, if the church is open, to walk into it and to see it. So it's one thing that you can see, right, that you'll be able to see. Um, what is scraffito? Uh, down below here, you have Slavinsky working uh, on the Fatima Shrine. There's a mural in the Fatima Shrine in, in um, Youngstown. Okay? Uh, he has it there. And his uh, a former student, uh, Michael uh, Badanowski, Michael uh, learned uh, in college from, uh, from uh, Yusuf, and then Michael helped him in doing different projects, okay? So the, the, the two of them were working. Now, what do you do? Okay, someone says, this is what I want. You follow whatever they want to do. You may need to do research on it. Or someone says, do whatever you want. And so he makes a decision, and he has to do research. And sometimes people say, how long does it take? Sometimes it takes longer to do the research than it is to do the execution of the, art, of the artwork. Makes sense? For, for, for many people, it does, right? Because what you do, okay, so you, for number one, you, you research, okay? Number two, on heavy paper now, you do a full-size drawing. So let's say that we're gonna do it on uh, that whole back wall. You do a full-size drawing of what, you're, what artwork you're gonna be putting up there. They, then, you, then you trace the cartoon, uh, it, it's called a cartoon. Then you trace the outlines on heavy transparent paper, number Four, you perforate, you make holes where those trace lines are, right? And then what you do is you prepare 
the surface, you pair the surface uh, of, the, of the wall, and then you mixed sand and lime and cement and your pigment. You may have a certain mixture to it, and then you apply it in different layers. Uh, he all, usually starts with a black layer and then a red layer and then a yellow layer and a silver gray layer. And what you need to do, this is where his background in chemistry as far as art material goes, is that you need to have a certain mixture of amount of water or not, uh, amount of how thick your layers are going to be of the the uh, curing time for that, the drying time for that, so that once he starts on putting that, that on the wall, he doesn't sleep very much. What you do, he said, people, okay, uh, um, uh, I'm gonna show a picture of Stan Novak, uh, uh, who worked in a building, who was working in a building that Sovinsky worked at, and he said that, you know, he had a little room, had a little closet space, whatever, that he sometimes took a nap, Okay? Uh, and then would go out and test the, the, the material, whatever, and then to work on it. Maybe take a little snack, okay? But basically, once it was going on the wall, it went quickly. It went quickly to be going on that, on that wall. All right, the, um, uh, uh, I, I forgot about number nine, to du you start dusting a, a, a powder on to give you a looking at the outline. And then what you do, Scarafito is subtracting. What you're doing is you're, let's say you have four layers of cement. So what you're doing is you want, if you want the, to go to the black, you have to cut down and subtract that cement. You get that cement out according to that line. You have to, you take that away. If you want the red, which is uh, the next one on, you only go down to that amount, right? So you need to be really, really swift and knowledgeable and of, of taking away, subtracting, taking away that concrete. That's what sgraffito comes from. Graf, like graph for writing, and S in Italian means to take it away, to subtract, okay, uh, for it. So, that, so that's sgraffito, and that's the reason why I put it at the bottom, okay, because I gave you a description of why that was, all right? Um, and here's the two, uh, here he is in two different uh, ways of applying that particular technique. Okay? Uh, just quickly through the assumption, uh, through Assumption Church, uh, now you gotta realize these are large, right? And they look like drawings, but they're scraffito. So that's cement that you've got up there, and it's pretty heavy, right? Uh, the symbol above the assumption, the assumption uh, in, in the Catholic uh, Church, uh, there is the tradition uh, that because Mary was the mother of God, uh, in other words, Jesus is considered you know, the son of God, and so she was the Mary of God, that she wouldn't undergo death, what they call it a dormition, meaning she fell asleep, okay? but rather than to be going someplace or whatever, whatever she, wa she was assumed into heaven, she was taken into heaven like a good kid will do for his mom, right? Okay, to do work right. So, uh, uh, and so you have their symbols, liturgical symbols, like it's the, oops, excuse me, okay, uh, the Alpha and the Omega standing for Jesus, the idea of the Eucharistic uh, a chalice and the, and the, um, uh, the bread, the wafer, right, that is uh, consecrated on the altar. And in Mary's womb, okay, she bore her son as well. So those symbols are symbolic. Uh, we're not gonna go uh, through all of them, but at least you have a chance that the Annunciation when the angel um, came to Mary to announce, uh, to ask whether she wanted to be uh, Jesus' uh, mother or the mother uh, of Jesus. And then the nativity, okay, and Chuck has some wonderful details uh, on that, and the flight into Egypt, and the pelican, uh, above that, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, tradition, again, the understanding of the Christ symbol of the pelican, that uh, in the Middle Ages, it's called a bestiary, where different animals represented different uh, people or our beliefs, and the pelican would sometimes be, we would be, uh, uh, Taking food, okay, and and then putting it into the the beaks of the of the of the uh, of the uh, uh, chicks or whatever, but also could, would kind of be be pruning or whatever. And some people thought that it looked like the the pelican was 
was injuring itself, and the blood that was flowing then would be fed to the uh, would be fed to the children. Again, remember, this is all sometimes in people's imagination, but that's where the symbol, uh, uh, some of the symbols come from. And then Jesus is taken down from the cross is the fifth scrafito. And in the stations of the cross, uh, in the Catholic Church, we have 15, uh, well, 14 or 15, if you count the resurrection as the station, and this would be the 13th station. Um, okay, so we've been inside. Now we're going to go outside. This is uh, uh, Stella Niagara in Lewiston, and I mentioned that they, uh, the sisters have a chapel, and, and uh, Yusuf and Michael did not only the scrafito work, I don't have good pictures of these, okay, now there's scrafito back here as well, they did wrought iron work over there, they did quite a bit of work, but I want you to pay attention to this back of the altar. This is the, the altar, the tabernacle, okay, and this is the back work. It was so made, this is the last, that's the last supper. It was so made that this is the Jesus figure, right, and if the, if the priest is standing at the altar over here, it's, he's taking Jesus's, Jesus's place, right? Are you losing my voice? You can hear me? Okay, all right. Um, so here's, here's a, a bigger picture of, that, of the altar, and there's Jesus, right, and the, and the apostles. And then uh, here's a reminder for you where it's at. And then here is a, a blessing. Here's the priest. Now, it's at a different angle, but if you realize, this is the center aisle. So if we were sitting, I mean, if we were standing over here, if we looked at him, he would be in, in Jesus' position. And don't worry, these are not Nazi, Nazi signs, okay? The people are raising their hands in blessing. They have been asked to please give a blessing to the sisters that um, are there. So uh, just to c console you for that. All right? Now in the back, uh, in the front yard, I should say, uh, closer to, uh, to the water, there's this beautiful field. And if you walk down the f in the field, there's a little grotto that's over there, right? And there is, okay, this little house. It's called the Little Chapel. And uh, here's a little, uh, a, a little uh, bigger detail of it, but it's small, it's small. And when I was uh, for a retreat over at, um, at Stella Niagara years and years and years and years ago, I asked, I, I, said, I, I went around looking and, and I said, gee, it's locked. How do you get in there? What's in there? Whatever. And you have to go and ask for a key, okay? Then I saw what was in there, and there was some scrafito in there. And there's also a shrine that's there that was also done by the same artist, okay? Joseph Slovinsky, right? Now, some of you who live in the area might remember that in 1955, there was flooding in Lewiston, in, in, in the area, uh, and it was because of an ice jam in March, okay? So we do have ice jams, and that little chapel that I showed you over here, this is near the water, this is at the edge of the water, and you're seeing that buildup of the ice, pushing up the, the ice and the freezing, right? It's like in a little island in itself, it's surrounded, the field is surrounded, so there's that, that little chapel that was still, that survived. Right? And here is uh, uh, another paper, um, I think, I forgot that it's Courier Express or Niagara Gazette, uh, uh, I have it down, but, but how, the, how, how that was affected, that little chapel was affected. Well, the sisters were so pleased that it survived the storm that when they got word from Assumption Parish, Monsignor Bogotsky, hey, we've got this guy, he's really good at what he's doing, and they were also doing some refurbishing in their convent, so they came, they did this inside work on the chapel, and uh, on the big chapel, and then on the little chapel. And here is a, a, a news article, by the way, in my research, not everything is digitized, Sometimes vertical files no longer exist. Sometimes the younger people may not know what I'm talking about, okay? Where you actually have newspapers, clippings that are cut or whatever, and so the art 
archivist for the convent, found this, she, we spoke for like an hour over the phone and then we hung up and then I get a call two minutes later, I found it, okay? And it was an article that she said the picture was just so bad that it was already disintegrating, okay? It was disintegrating, but it, it was a clue to a question that I had asked her before. So not everything is online, okay? But here you have them mixing the pigment. Remember, one of the processes is to mix the pigment. And both of them were former uh, professors from the University of Warsaw, okay? So here's inside the chapel, but it's small, right? You, and, you, and I didn't take the pictures, okay? But uh, this is Our Lady of the Angels, and look what she's protecting. She's protecting the little, the little chapel that's over there. Right? And then this is St. Francis and some of the sisters over there. Right? And you have then uh, uh, some, uh, you have some, I think that's um, Our Lady of the Angels that, that's up there. So that's inside. Uh, you can do that. And then uh, although they were founded in, they, they moved there. They were founded earlier. Okay, but uh, when they moved there in 1908, uh, their foundress was from the Netherlands. But there was a, a big contingent of, of people from Hungary, so forth, in the Buffalo area, and some, and some uh, Polish, and so forth. So, they, so they, they moved then to the site in 1908, and then uh, it became a peace site. Now, why did it become a peace site? Okay, well, oopsie. Uh, when Slavinsky was doing the work for Stella Niagara, in 1964, right, 1963, 64, it was 63, 64. Um, he had heard, uh, he was shocked for the, at the assassination of John Fitzgerald Kennedy, okay? It was November of 1963. I think those of us that are old enough might remember when that was announced. Remember, we didn't have, we didn't have computers in those days and so forth. When it was announced, uh, we, I can remember where I was, and he was so touched by that violent act okay, of the assassination of, of John Kennedy, and he wanted them to show how the Polish people had admired him Okay, and he wanted to do something that was going to commemorate uh, uh, the memory of John F. Kennedy. So he decided, okay, he asked the sisters, and, and they worked together, and he, they spoke together, um, and it's called the, they call it the Niagara Peace Memorial, right? But they're all images of a John, not an outhouse, okay? Okay, of a John, okay, okay, John's. So, okay, so uh, this is the outside of, of the, it looks kind of like a shell, okay, here's a shell, right, and when you, when you enter here, okay, when you enter over here, St. John the Baptist is baptizing not only Jesus in the background, but St. John the Baptist has a whole crowd of people from, of different colors, different time periods, okay, but John the Baptist and the symbol that he stands for the truth, right? Then you have John the Apostle. This is a Pieta. Remember that 13th station of the cross, that assumption, when Jesus is taken down from the cross and laid in his mother's arms? It's a Pieta. Okay, so in the back of Mary holding her dead son, okay, is the beloved disciple John, right? And so John stands the symbol of love, then over here, you can't see him that well in this, in this picture, is Pope John XXIII. Pope John XXIII was the argumento, the uh, kind of a shaking up of uh, what was happening in the church and saying, we got to open the doors, we got to open the windows, and we've got we've to ha have it important for today. What is today's uh, believer uh, uh, needing and so forth? And so uh, Saint, uh, uh, he wasn't a saint at the time, but Pope John XXIII started Vatican II, right? And over here is a, uh, when he is uh, having the canonization of Saint Martin de Porres. Canonization means someone has made a saint, and Martin de Porres was not white, okay? Right? So, so uh, all, justice for all, justice for all. And then in the back, okay, and I don't have, I don't have a picture of the back, uh, be, behind, uh, behind this, oops, be, 
well, behind this and behind this, there are pictures, but uh, uh, one of them is of, of John Kennedy. Okay, one John, and, and of, uh, it's of him walking. Uh, um, I do have a, a, a detail from it, and I'll, I'll show that to you. All right, the, on the back of where this is, you have a quotes from two sources. This is from Pope John the 23rd. He wrote an encyclical, which means a letter. He wrote a letter to, to the congregations, and he called it Pachem and Terris, which means peace on earth peace on earth, okay? And there's a quote, okay, from, from that in 1963. Uh, by the way, John the 23rd died in 1963, okay, um, uh, a little bit uh, later, okay, but uh, he died in 63. And John Kennedy then, uh, they have a quote from his inauguration uh, address that's on there. So it, it, was, it was not a simple little shrine. It was a, a complicated move, and, and I'm told that that's still out there. Um, I, I, the sister uh, archivist told me that uh, the Land Conservancy, it's okay, I guess, for people you know, to walk around, but you, you'd need to get the key from them, not from the sisters now, for the little chapel. Okay? Um, this is the, a, a little detail from the back from the back. It's not the kind of color that you see in the front, but it's uh, John Kennedy, and uh, he is, uh, I have a bit more. Okay, what John Kennedy is, uh, uh, he is leaving behind the buildings of this earth, and, and the United Nations building is included in that, and he is going home, he's going home across the meadow, okay, uh, to his eternal life, right? So that it, it's, it's symbolic, it's, a, it's the imagery, and you see that over here, um, a little different uh, structure, and he's ha holding a rolled, um, uh, uh, a rolled uh, uh, papers in his hand, and it stands for the, in order to have all of that other stuff, you need, uh, you need liberty. You need freedom. You need, you need to have that. Okay, so, so that was his symbol for that. Um, now, Joseph Slavinsky, uh, his wife tells me that uh, he he had uh, he was lived during wartime and suffered a lot in Europe. Saw all the destruction. So all these churches and public buildings that he was restoring, okay, he, he saw not only, the, not only to the buildings but to, to humans, uh, and, uh, and uh, he had an injury because of the war in, to his ear. So he could not understand, he couldn't understand enough to hear better, uh, better to know English, to be able to pronounce English very well. So he, it was very rudimentary for him to be, to be uh, hearing you and understanding you, okay, and then to reply to you fluently. And uh, so that's why he needed a, a translator, he, uh, you know, a translator, and that's how Wanda met him. She was, she was asked to be his translator, his, his wife, okay, he, she was asked to be his translator for some work, and, um, and, and she remained that, okay, for, uh, for all of his time uh, with her. But this is his quote. These days, everyone talks about peace, but no one does anything about it. It seems rather that most are preparing for war. An artist such as I, a muralist, would love to create a lasting tribute to the idea of peace. I have prepared many projects with this theme in mind. And you've just seen that the John Shrine over in Lewiston uh, is one of them. Right? Before you can have peace, however, maybe to appreciate it, maybe you have to realize the experience that some people are having, okay, or maybe you have had, because of violence, no matter what kind, because of not respecting the human setting, not respecting the nature, not respecting the person. Right. So Maximilian Kolbe was um, uh, a friar, whatever, and uh, uh, Joseph did a work at the St. Francis uh, Conventual Residence in Athol Springs. You know where St. Francis High School is? Okay, well, this, this is on the same campus, okay? And in their chapel, uh, there are 
lots of works by Slavinsky, right? And this is by Maximilian Kolbe. Uh, this is Auschwitz. He was assigned to Auschwitz. He was in Auschwitz uh, in, in, the, in the war. And uh, he did wear a pr prison uh, uniform, the stripes. Uh, but over here, Slavinsky has him wearing the order, the habit of the order, right? And, and why, why, well, he wasn't a saint in 1967. That happened in the 1980s when the Pope declared him a saint. Uh, in other words, someone that you could then look at or that you could admire, right? But um, uh, what he did is that uh, the commandant was, was going to be uh, killing people, having people die. And so it didn't matter who you were, you, 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 okay? Didn't have a choice. And the one of the 10, he was gonna be calling 10 that day, one of the 10 was uh, a man who had a wife and who had children, and he said, what, am I, my, what are they gonna do? And, and Maximilian comes and takes his place. And so he gives his life in order to save another. And when, when Maximilian was, uh, was um, made into a saint, Okay. Uh, the people that knew him at that time, the survivor, had come okay, to, to see that. So uh, he did such work or in City Hall, in our City Hall, if you go into the entrance, there's the uh, Katyn Memorial, and I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce it. I asked six different Polish people, and they gave it to me six different ways, okay? So, so uh, but uh, it's uh, Katyn, Katyn, or whatever. Uh, what happened is there was, um, it was the 40th anniversary in 1980 of this massacre. Okay, there were, uh, there, uh, uh, the, uh, Polish intelligentsia, Polish um, uh, military leaders, uh, the people who knew how to lead and so forth uh, had been uh, prisoners of war, and there was a, there was a massacre, both at the forest, Katyn Forest, okay, and some areas around there. So that um, Slavinsky was asked to do a memorial for them. Uh, uh, and uh, the plaque on it says, this plaque was presented to the people of the city of Buffalo by the Polish American Citizens Organization in memory of their fellow brothers, prisoners of war, massacred by Soviet Russia at Katyn Forest in the spring of 1940. Mayor James Griffin uh, was assisted in the unveiling of this plaque on April the 27th, 1980 by family members of those Polish officers murdered at Katyn. Right now, where is this? Well, this is Chuck Lacuse's uh, details, but it's wonderful. It's like a Hieronymus Bosch, if you know that that painter, okay, and that did all of these uh, sometimes not so so pleasant scenes. Uh, so you can see the skulls, and you can see um, uh, the horror uh, of man's inhumanity to man. Uh, but there's also uh, uh, Mary. Mary, the mother of Jesus, with her infant child. And uh, for many Polish Catholics, uh, they have great devotion to our uh, Mary under the title of Our Lady of Częstochowa. There's a whole story for the Lady of Częstochowa. But if you look, uh, uh, she, uh, when we uh, go back to the, the uh, bigger picture, she's in the upper left-hand corner, and you can see that she and her child are not smiling. And you can see that her hands can be pretty smooth. So these probably are tears that are coming. It's not only the slash that the Our Lady of Częstochowa, that, that, that picture had, and there's a whole topic on that, okay, but, uh, but she is sorrowful for the loss of, of that life. Okay, the life that you had. So here's the, the picture again. I just wanted to give you of where that is. The picture of Mary is in, would be in this section, okay? But when you walk into the lobby of City Hall and you go straight past the center kiosk or the, the desk over there, the wall to your right, okay, the, there's a corner, okay, there's a corner, and if you turn, if you make a right on that corner, you can go down where you, what? get your license, pay your fines, I've forgotten what that is, but it, you, go, you go down over, and that's where the location of that, of that plaque is, okay? Now, that plaque, by the way, was taken down, and it was 
um, uh, uh, was it cleaned? Okay, it was polished up. The the the, the copper that had because uh, it's, it's hammered copper. The uh, copper had already had a patina on it. And Mayor Byron Brown, because this was just two years ago that it was put back. Okay, Byron Brown and his quote. Uh, there was more that he said, but what he said, he said, the important thing about today's rededication of that memorial is that we aren't just rededicating a newly restored copper memorial, we are rededicating ourselves to remember the importance of human kindness to all people. In other words, we need to be kind, we need to be peace for everybody, for everyone. And so Buffalo is a mixed community of all different kinds of backgrounds. Right? Well, since we're in City Hall, there's a seal, uh, seal of the City of Buffalo in the mayor's office. And I asked uh, docents who give tours of City Hall and go into the mayor's office, okay, and I was told, yes, it's still hanging there. And why he, uh, Slavinsky uh, did this, Okay, why he did it is because um, I think the mayor at the time only had a cardboard, a cardboard version okay, of it, and he wanted it to be more official. Right? And this gives you a little bit of idea how it looks. This is on the, on the outside of City Hall. This is the outside. So you can see it says seal, okay, and here it says seal. And then although this is of over here, uh, Slovinsky puts it off the seal of Buffalo. Here are ships, here are some ships, here's the lighthouse, here's the lighthouse, and then the water. Okay? I, I, I don't see on this seal that Slovinsky did barges, unless those things are supposed to be barges. I'd have to go and take a, a quicker look on it. But he's in City Hall. If you've ever seen this, that's what uh, Joseph Slovinsky had did that. Now, also uh, at um, Slavinsky had been asked by the purest fathers who had come to, uh, uh, to Buffalo area. Uh, they had had a lot of persecution through war and um, uh, Catholic, uh, hatred of Catholics or whatever. They came to the area and they bought the Darren Martin House on the Lake. Okay, they bought that in 1950. Now they used it as a uh, residence for uh, their people, and eventually the people that were coming in. So what did they do? They added onto it. They added a chapel on onto it. They added, without damaging the other building okay, that existed. I have over here, this is how the, uh, it's a current, uh, probably a current photo, okay? But this is the basically the house on the, the lake in Derby, uh, Gray Cliff, okay? uh, and uh, so you can see that the Pierist fathers, this was now in 2002, the Pierist fathers, from the time that they were there, they were from there from 1950 to 1999, they added, they added rooms, and they had people who had come in, immigrants, people who were poor and who stayed there, um, and so they were servicing the poor. and. Um, uh, Bruce Fisher, in, his, in that article on the two books, makes an interesting thing. He says that at age 91, Frank Lloyd Wright came to visit Great Cliff, okay? And he sees, this is in 1958, okay? And he sees, oh my God, you know how particular Frank Lloyd Wright is, right? You know, well, he sees that they've built on, they built a chapel, they've blocked his thing, and he was really upset, okay? until, Bruce Fisher says, that he was told okay, of who the Pierce fathers were, why they did that, and how much they had suffered, and then Frank Lloyd Wright accepted it. Okay? I think that's saying a lot for those of you that know architectural history, okay? um, because he was very particular. Okay, so, so Greycliff, this was the construction of it, uh, I mean, the, of the mural. He did the construction. It was in honor of the 350th anniversary of the founding of the order. But you can see already from this picture, this is, this is not the leaves of the trees. This is the damage from the weather. You can see over here how the concrete, how the cement okay, has been uh, uh, worked on. Okay, so um, Peter Gessner, 
Peter Gessner, God rest his soul. Okay, Peter Gessner raised money okay, through the Polish Arts Club uh, and other uh, donors and got professional people to pack up that mural and to move it. All right? It didn't cost um, uh, an arm and a leg, it cost the whole body. Let me tell you, it was, it was, it was, uh, I've forgotten how many thousands upon thousands. It was started off 160,000, 125,000. Okay. So it, it was, it was a lot of money. It was a lot of money, okay? Um, so, uh, okay, so then its new home is at Buff State, outside the Butler Library. If you know Buff State, if you know the Butler Library, uh, it's around the corner from the main entrance. There's a lot of construction at Buff State now. Okay, but uh, uh, this is the north. This is the north side. Face, this, this side faces north. Okay, so that if you're coming in from where the student union is and you're coming into the library, you're not going to see it. Right, and uh, but if you go along the side, this is where it is, and it was repaired. It was restored, um, and Wanda so. She said it with love in her voice, and the person who restored it, she said, I, I, let, I gave him uh, useless tools. So it, the tools that made the mural were used by the guy who now repaired the mural. Okay? Um, and this is the, you can see how, what a good job then, uh, that you saw how uh, erect it was before. All right. Uh, Going, I'm going to go quickly now. Villa Maria College has uh, Chopin. No, I'm sorry, just a mural of him, okay? Uh, and uh, that was made by Sofito. And just as the mural of Greycliff was on the move, this is also on the move, okay? It is so heavy, they have it on rollers, a very a, a strong thing that was just made so that they can, if they need to, that they can, they can roll it, okay? They can roll. Uh, Chuck Lacusa's uh, uh, details, just so that you give you a better appreciation. Remember, layers of color in cement that are hand subtracted. All of that was made with that. Okay, uh, and then uh, Frederick uh, Chopin, of course, uh, a Polish, uh, Polish, um, and he died uh, rather young. Right. Uh, they also have Copernicus, who's more stable. Right, uh, home is in the library. I checked with Lucy, uh, and she 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 went to make sure that they actually were up. She knew it was the one Copernicus, and she went to see if Chopin was still in the building. He was. He hadn't left it. Okay. Um, uh, now, and in, in at Damon College, from what, online, I saw this article that uh, that had that Peter Gessner had put on that. And uh, 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 Garner had, had given a talk. And this was the image that was on it. And I said, wow, okay, that's by Slavinsky. That's by Slavinsky. Here it says the artist as creator. Here's the artist. Okay, here's one of his tools. Here's another tool. Uh, A R T spells art. R H C stands for. Rosary Hill College, okay, because this is at Rosary Hill College. And so the uh, Melissa, who's only two years in the library there, after it's been Damon College, had no idea what I was talking about. Okay, so I sent her. I sent her this picture. I sent her. I said, and so she showed it to people who were around in the college, and uh, I, I, she said, I found it. I found it. Right. Um, and so I went. Okay, I went in to see, and she gave me uh, uh, the tour of where it was, and it is this. Now, you say, how come I couldn't get a better picture? Because I'm not Chocolate Kusa, okay? However, okay, I couldn't get a better picture because this, this is about two feet by four feet. It's above a doorway in Dun Scotus Hall. The, what you, the light that you see here, there are doors that go down here, you know, it opens up, that's a hall, and there are stairs that are over here. There were a lot of students at that time coming down the stairs, going up, going to the, I mean, th that's a busy campus. So I thought at least for this presentation, did you have how colorful it is? Color makes a difference, doesn't it? That you have, and that was by Slavinsky, and he did that um, back in 1964, okay? And so, uh, 68, excuse me, it was 68, about 68. So there's a little, little better uh, picture, but at least you had an idea on that, okay? 
moving along, okay, uh, I saw in the vertical file uh, of yellowing newspaper articles that he had also done a, a, a canticle of the sun with St. Francis, couldn't be found. Melissa said, I asked everybody. I went to every building. I couldn't find it. I couldn't find it. Couldn't find where, where, where it is. So um, I talked to Wanda, Z uh, Joseph's widow, and she said, oh, and she very sadly tells me that they, when there was uh, uh, buildings that were going up and they were changing things around, uh, what they did is they removed that um, canticle of the sun work. And I guess it was, very, it was very heavy and very large. And they were going to be moving it to the sister's residence in Lewiston. Okay, but they didn't have the sophisticated art movers that Peter Gessner had been responsible and raising the money to get. They put it in the back of a pickup truck. By the time, Sister Mary, the archivist says, she was there when it arrived, okay? Okay, and she said it was just broken. It was just all broken. So I called Melissa at the librarian, and I said to her, Melissa, don't feel bad that you couldn't find it. It no longer exists, okay? So it happens, okay, it happens. Um, now, something that still exists, although it's not necessarily open to the public unless you ask, is the uh, Commodore Perry at Black Rock, which is inside the West Hurdle um, Academy, right, which is on the corner of Military and Hurdle. And what you have here are you have Commodore Perry, okay, who bought, I think there were five ships that he bought uh, for the war uh, to help him in of the, of the nine uh, that he needed for the war. He's talking with the shipbuilder and, and the shipbuilder, um, uh, I think uh, part of the crew. Uh, I, I, I'm going, going quickly with this and this was um, uh, Perry's manservant over here. Here is what they're, they're doing, they're building. Over here is a school. Notice the kids going up to the school, so it's a recognition that this also is a school that it's in. Um, and uh, here is a Native American who's uh, stylized, of course, uh, not of course, but stylized, at least in Slavinsky's mind, who's looking at all the changes that are happening to the, to the, to the Buffalo area. Um, uh, there's Stan Novak, who is also a, a president for the Bushel Pine Arts Academy, but Stan also uh, worked at, at, at that school. He was a librarian, uh, and he said that he was there when Slavinsky was doing his work, so he really got to see, he's one of the men who realized that guy just never, doesn't sleep much. He just, he works, 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 and he said he got a chance. Slavinsky allowed him to do a little bit of work on that mural, and he said probably then he went back and he, he went over it anyway, right? But he, he let, he let, he let the, the artist do that. In Erie County community, um, uh, ECMC uh, Medical Center, uh, there is a three-part mural, and this could be a talk in itself. And I would be happy to give it if someone wants it. But uh, he, uh, oops, some people may not have realized that you know we we talk about the Holland Land Company. Well, here is a, a Polish uh, surveyor who worked for the Holland Land Company. Uh, you have uh, uh, the Saint, um, uh, Saint Stanislaus that was well, that was established is in Polonia, and usually the schools that they built were staffed by the Felician Sisters, right? Uh, uh, and you had people who fought for the Poli Polish uh, freedom in overseas and, and now are coming uh, 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 to, to America to also help fight for the country. Uh, over here, you see uh, Madame Curie, okay, Marie, uh, Marie Curie. You have, uh, uh, again, Pol uh, Polish dancers, so uh, Copernicus, Okay, so you have, you have uh, uh, all, all a celebration of, of Polish influence, positive influence in all areas. And the third panel, uh, third panel, uh, you have Our Lady of Częstochowa, 
Remember I told you about the marks on her, on her cheek and so forth, but you have, you have uh, so, some, some of these are specific people uh, and some of them are uh, just a general thing, like for example over here, this is a young, a young person in, in her communion dress. So the idea of other things. All right, now, right, uh, baptism of Mieszko, uh, uh, in 966, uh, the leader of Poland was baptized, and by being baptized, he became part of Christianity that was uh, the guardian of literacy in Europe. And for the last couple centuries before his baptism in 966, um, uh, they tried to form a, a state in, in Poland in the area, and people weren't literate. Okay, so now that now that. Uh, that 966, kind of the official state uh, of, uh, of Poland, and for the celebration of the millennium, okay, 1,000 years, okay, my parents had this book, right? It's not, it's, it's pretty heavy, okay? But uh, at the front and the back covers uh, from, you'll have the front, are from the, you can see this afterwards then. It's Slowinski's artwork that they have from front, two different, in the front and, and the back inside covers, all right? And we have also in St. Joseph's Cathedral, this is the hammered copper of the same uh, situation. Real quickly, Yusuf was asked if he wanted to have wanted to come to live in Niagara Falls, okay, to live in Niagara Falls. So um, they have a home. Right, the last house on Buffalo Avenue, nearest the rapids. If you've ever passed it by, okay, uh, what he did is he had his studio there, all right, and a gallery. And here, uh, Chuck, I think is your picture. You took a picture of the, and it says the gallery and the, um, the studio. And, and in the backyard, this is what it caught me. When I would go, my, sometimes I'd go for walks, and I'll, I'll walk, the, not walk from where I live to Niagara Falls, but I'll drive the car, I'll walk around, and I'm saying, what the heck is that? What is that? That is a big, a 20 foot by nine foot, made of the mist, scraffito, made with cement, layered cement, all right? And, and uh, there's a detail of it on the bottom. It's been out in the weather for a long time. Yusuf died in 1983. Okay? Wanda doesn't have the money to, to uh, fix it up. Peter Gessner tries to get somebody to pay attention to do that. Okay? Here's Peter. Okay, this was in um, uh, uh, maybe 2012. I've forgotten that uh, I, I have the uh, article later on in the film. But look at the size of that, okay? Look at the size of it. And he's pointing out, uh, oh, it was the Niagara Gazette, okay? It was a 2012 article. And uh, uh, he's, he's, he's pointing out, and you really can't see it yet, but here's a picture that James Neese, the Niagara Gazette staff photographer, took. You see all that? Okay. It's really, really, okay, um, that, but, but if it's still up, uh, I haven't, I tried to pick out and make sure that th things were up, and I didn't have a chance to go to see, and I didn't ask Wanda. Uh, I didn't ask, oh, how do I? Uh, Our Lady of Fatima Shrine in Youngstown in the Dome Chapel, you've got, uh, that, those are, by the way, those are the same thing. This was uh, not such a great photograph of it, this is the more recent photograph that I found. It's the peace mural, okay? It's the peace mural. And uh, what, what he does is he has a pregnant woman that's in the center. That's the future, okay? That's the future. And around this pregnant woman are people of four different skin colors to represent the people from around the world, right? On this side, you have an atom bomb. And if people, if the human race makes a decision to destroy each other, you can see all the anguish of the people here. If the human race makes a decision to have peace, okay, you look at the, these are rejoicings, these are, these are happy faces that you have over here. And the spirit is joining in, okay, the world, this is the world, is joining in the hemispheres together. It's not only we in the West Hemisphere or someone in the East Hemisphere, so we are all one, okay? And, and, and in 1974, Joseph Slavinsky made that. 
Okay, made that. Um, unfortunately, they moved it. I shouldn't say unfortunately. They didn't have the professional work, and it was moved, and I, I, I know that the people who were there did the best that they could, right? And uh, uh, when we went to see it in 2011, I can see Peter, Dr. Gessner, look at that, okay, look at that. He saw all the cracks, he saw all the things on it, but, but you know, they did the best that they could, and it still exists, and I didn't, I didn't find out whether it's still, it's no longer in the chapel, it's behind, it's like in the sacristy part. But to, to the idea of this, uh, I think this is one of the priests over from, uh, from the Fatima Shrine, Oops, I, I don't know where, but the, it gives you the size of the mural. There, it, there are the pretty big figures as well. Okay. Uh, you know, Niagara Falls, the water flows. We know it can sometimes be stopped, but it flows and life keeps on going. And sometimes we have our ups and downs and we have our challenges, we have our successes. And Solinsky had a lot of challenges as well. I didn't even get into uh, uh, some of them today. But through it all, okay, Slavinsky realized that what he was doing was not a grandiose a display of his talent, but he worked humbly Right, in order then to show the respect for nature, for each other, okay, and for okay, the belief, the God that, that we might have faith in. So I thank you for your patience. I, this was just a really quick giving you a, a, a selection of some of Slavinsky's work. And if you didn't know about it before, I hope that that you're going to investigate a bit more on it, and uh, I thank you for your staying. Now, I know some people have to go, but if, does anybody have a question? Question? Okay. Thank you. Oh. Pardon? Are there any artists currently that do this type of work? Oh, I they uh, uh, and Wanda uh, tells me she says not many want to do that. He had gone Slavinsky, beside all of his uh, his training, uh, had gone to Rome to specifically learn that. Okay, so he spent time. He 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 was uh, studying in Rome in order to get it because this was from ancient times. This is what what was on the walls or whatever. And I don't think too many people today. Are, are into that, okay? But I don't know, that's, that's not a researched answer, it's just what, what someone had then said to me, okay? Wanda, his wife, okay, All right, yes. Okay. Anyone else? Thank you, thank you once again, and I appreciate the work. All right, and now we will do our drawing really quickly for the uh, tickets to the City of Light bus tour. Eleanor, would you like to do the honors? Oh, okay. <laughs> right in here. Do I have one? You've got, there you go, yep. Is it one? Yep. Okay. And our winner is Jean King. Lovely, Jean. Congratulations. <laughs> so, Jean, I'll give you a call tomorrow. <laughs> thank you again, everybody, for being here with us on this cold night. Um, thank you again to Eleanor, to all of our volunteers who made this possible, Chuck, our tech recording guy, and Rama, our security guy. Thank you to all of you. We will see you back here in two weeks for our final uh, speaker series of this session. We'll have a presentation on terracotta and then a presentation on Buffalo as an early modern powerhouse. I hope you'll be able to join us. Get home safely.